Hello, football family. Welcome into Huddle It Up Films. The Ravens, once again, Alec, 34 31. Another overtime win. Another come from behind win. Ravens move to 6 and 2 with their win over the Minnesota Vikings. Here to join me. Now, Chris uh, usually joins me, Alec, but he is in depth with some daddy time, daddy daughter time. So, Chris, shout out to you. Enjoy your night. But, Alec from Ravens Recap joining me. Alec, how are you doing this evening? Doing well. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Um, definitely a fun game to watch. I was lucky enough to watch it with some family um, and get to have a little bit of an atmosphere to it. Not too crazy. Not too many people were like actively watching it, but it was just kind of cool. It felt a little bit higher stakes. I know when I'm watching the close games like this at home by myself on the couch, I'm just kind of like, you know, I'm reading Twitter. I'm writing my notes. I'm just like kind of quiet, but I had a couple people to break me out of my, uh, my normal monotony and you know, have some fun with it. Some high fives. So it was fun. That's cool. Was anybody saying some crazy stuff you didn't just didn't agree with? Cause sometimes that gets me well, when I'm like at the game or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We, well, we had a, a, a hater there. Um, <laughs> he's a, I mean, he's, he has a different fanship, right? So he's not like a huge Ravens fan. So he was trying to be the, uh, the Debbie downer on situations, but uh, you know, all in good fun. I know he was just trying to, to get us going. But uh, yeah, we, we had a good time watching the game and I tell you, man, it didn't look pretty at first. I was kind of shaking my head. I was thinking to myself, do we waste a bye week? It doesn't seem like we really instituted a lot of things we talked about on the bye week show that you came on to Ravens recap about. Um, it looked like just kind of a, a, a big miss. And um, to be frank, I don't think they they I, it still felt that way. Uh, I still feel like this looked a lot like the same team we saw before the bye. Um, not that many changes, in my opinion, but overall, we still came out ahead. They got clicking, and you know what it means when we start clicking, right? On both sides of the ball. Both sides of the ball really started to perform. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point. I mean, I'm looking at the first, what is it, five drives, field goal, three punts, and an interception. So that's that was the Ravens' first five drives. Then they score four, four straight touchdowns. So yep. it was, uh, you know, a tale of two halves, but uh, – really started with that last drive of the first half to make the game close. And then what happens? Okay, we're back in this game. It was ugly. You know, we're only down by a little bit. Opening kickoff of the third quarter gets returned. And then it felt like, oh, man, here we go again. But these Ravens, Alec, we've seen it all year. Resilient team. It really is. And when you have number eight, you're never out of it. Never out, dude. Never out. And, you know, you see them down by 14. But to me, that's not that crazy because, like you said, you know, you score one touchdown, that's that's seven. And then you have one stop, you score again, or you, you know, it it, it just takes one stop after you score from a 14-point deficit to make it not feel that bad anymore. So I don't get too scared from 14 points. It's really that 21 that starts to kind of irk me, the three-possession the three possession game, because it takes a lot more stacking at that point. But... um. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those momentum things. We were talking about it during Ravens recap that um, Peter said that he felt like after the defense made a stand after the quick interception throw in the first half by Lamar, that he felt confident the Ravens were going to win because the defense stopped him, the offense came back and scored, and that was the formula. And we, that's exactly what we saw the rest of the game, that formula of stops, touchdown, stops, touchdown, to regain control and go ahead. Um to me, it took until the Pat Ricard drive to start feeling that confidence because I felt like that was just scrappiness, figuring out a way to will and get the score that, um, you know, that we were within seven. And I felt like, okay, we might be able to pull this together. Yeah. I mean, a win is a win. If this is the kind of stuff that's going to come back and play this against better teams, though, Alec. That's the, that's the big fear among Ravens fans. And, and there's truths like, you play a team like Minnesota who we could run the ball on with ease as we please really with, with these older backs and some uneven offensive line play, but that's not going to be the case in every game. So a lot of, lot, lot to dig into, but we have to start with the man, the myth, the legend, Lamar Jackson making his case for our second MVP season. He is on pace. Now somebody else with better numbers did this, but for almost 4,700 yards passing, and almost 1,300 yards rushing. I mean, 
that's that's six thousand yards he could potentially have if he stayed on this pace. Just absolutely insane. He tied an NFL record. It's his tenth one hundred yard rushing game. Come back from three double digit deficits already in eight games. He said the third overtime um, game that the Ravens have played. And really, Lamar got off to such a slow start. But once he gets going, Alec is just like he can become unstoppable. He is an unstoppable force at times through every game. You're totally right, Jason. Like we've seen it so many times. I love the meme going around of him in that uh, big black warmth coat. Uh, it's like Ravens can't come from behind. And you just see him like say on the sidelines down two touchdowns in that coat. And he looks ready to, to kill. Yeah, I mean that that's uh that's Lamar right there. I mean, they they have full trust. You know, you hear Hollywood Brown talk about it. They don't think they're ever out of it. They just shake it off and go out there and perform the next drive. And uh, that's that's invaluable, man, to have that level of confidence. And then in the fan base too. Like I'm over. Like I said to you, like three touchdowns where I started to get nervous. Two touchdowns, we got this. Like even with like nine minutes left, I guess against I think it was against the Colts. It was still two touchdowns against the Colts. Nine minutes. I was like, that's, that's doable. That's easy. You know, we got Lamar Jackson. I mean, it's, it's really cool to see when he gets hot. Um, and to be frank, um, seldom does he get hot and slow down, right? It's the slow starts that are brutal to this team, but once it gets going, it doesn't really seem to get stopped. Um, if you get this team on a roll, um, it's really, really positive. Yeah, and the deep ball, of course, is, is being taken away more and more. And you could see the adjustment yesterday where we just started taking what the defense gave us. And, and from there, we have the kind of receivers to really make that work now. But, yeah, Lamar started 6-14 of 14 for 56 yards and one interception. After that, he was 21-27, 210, three touchdowns and one pick. So, it, you know, once he gets started, it, it's amazing. We just need to find a way to, to start faster and be more consistent. Uh, but, but yeah, it was a lot of fun to watch. I mean, the two touchdown deficit didn't bother me. I was kind of just settled in and just waiting for things to go right. And I don't know about you, Alec, but like when we're down, but we're beating ourselves, it's kind of like, okay, we just need to get this thing going. We just need things to go our way. Whereas if somebody's coming out and playing the game of their life and they look on fire, that's when I start to get nervous as, a, as an opposing fan. But the Ravens were just, it felt like self, self-inflicted self drive killers, big plays allowed, just, we, we seemed like we were the better team the whole time. It just took a while to, for that to start showing. Yeah, I completely agree, man. Uh, that's a very good take. Whereas, you know, the Bengals game, we never looked on top of our game, and they always looked on their A game. That, when we were down two scores, I did not feel the same way that I did against the Vikings. And I think it comes to your point that, the Vikings weren't doing too much to impress. They had a couple big plays against us, um, but they didn't have just like consistency, which I think is something the Ravens eventually did have. They had long sustained drives. They were able to convert on third down to get more snaps. I mean, they had an unbelievable amount of snaps. If I look at my sheet over here, uh, 98, 98. 98. Unbelievable. Uh, 98 is unbelievable. Even for an overtime game, it's completely unheard of. If you look at this, you know, game book every week like we do it that you don't see anything like that. Um, and and it showed it really showed that uh, the conditioning of the Ravens really came in clutch on the offensive side, because that's that's when they really started to road grade them on the run game. Those last couple of possessions when they already were, you know, a full game in and like probably 60 some snaps at that point, man, that's when we started running. That's when the run game really clicked and we just had the domination at the point of attack moving piles for like the first time all year. That was uh, kind of huge and apparently a part of the game plan. If you listen to Harv's presser, they said their whole game plan was basically going to make them tired. They wanted to stay in it until they made them tired and they got there uh, and, and then they were able to execute and dominate. Yeah. The, the, this Vikings team was kind of soft in the middle without Michael Pierce, of course, but mm -hmm. it was one of those games where we really could overpower them up the middle, keep control of the ball. Um, so that was nice to see. But, yeah, I mean, we played for almost 70 minutes. The Ravens had the ball for 46 minutes. The Vikings, not even 24 minutes. So the Vikings had the ball for less than a half in a game that went five quarters. And that's going to hopefully bode well for this defense coming up on a short week, too. I, th I think they only played 50, what was it, 55 snaps you have it in front of you? Yeah, probably. 54. 
54. 54. Same, same so, idea. So, so the in a in a game that went almost five quarters, the the defense had a lighter load than most games. So, pretty crazy there. But those running backs, uh, it was nice to see. And uh, I have to hand it to Devontae Freeman because the first few times that I saw him this year, I was like, ah, I don't know if he can help us, but he by far looks like the most comfortable back in this offense. 13 carries, 79 yards, over six yards per carry. Le'Veon Bell chipped in, another 48 yards. And then Tyson Williams, 18 snaps. He had zero touches. He actually had a carry, but it was uh, called back on a penalty. Right. So uh, what do you see from the running get back group? Uh, can we get more pr- production out of the run game? Uh, pretty much like we we were able to do in this game. Could that be a sign for the future, or was this just running into a, a team that had trouble stopping the run? Yeah, I'll be honest with you, man. I don't have um, too much to say about it because of what you just said. The Ravens have been very successful running the ball when everyone's had success running the ball. And I don't think that's enough indication of success right now to say one way or the other. Now, if you look at the Miami game coming up, I know that's not what this pod's about. I do think it's quite interesting. Miami's a very middle-of-the-road team when it comes to um, running yards. They're, they, they're very porous on pass yards, which is fascinating given the draft capital and some of the names you'll hear on their defensive end, uh, you know, the defensive backfield. But I think if the Ravens are able to produce a running game against the Dolphins and maybe the Bears, you know, two teams that are much better against the run, I'll have some more confidence. But these games against the Chargers and and um, the Vikings here aren't quite enough, particularly with the Vikings having the injuries to both Hunter and Pierce. Um, I just can't get too excited about it. Now, I will say, kudos to Freeman, right? I was over here crying that he needed to be cut, that he was the least juice. I didn't see why the people, Rams were keeping him around. But uh, this is a great testament to the fact that we don't see everything. And uh, he's definitely, like, he started to show promises in the passing game. He started seeing those contributions. But then even just running, he seemed more and more comfortable. And while he doesn't have the agility he once had and the burst that he once had, he has that wisdom. And that's going to be enough uh, in the short term. Now, do I still want to see an unleashing of either Williams or uh, McCrary? Yes, I do. Uh, I think it's kind of crazy that Williams was in there for the same amount of snaps as Bell, but had way, way less opportunity. I think it's quite interesting. Um, but, I, you know, I guess it's an improvement uh, in, in a way for this rush uh, rushing attack. And it wasn't all Lamar, so I guess we'll we'll take what we can get. Uh, it's going to be a progression, as we talked about. You know, the blueprint. It's going to take, I think, a while, I, maybe all season, for the Ravens to keep improving this. But at least there's a growth area, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm kind of on the same page. You know, I got a little too excited, I think, after the Chargers game, and was yeah. like, okay, we're back. You know, we can run the ball, but <laughs> that turned into be an aberration. But, you know, I, I do feel like that, you know, there's some upside there is what you're saying. Just the, the game coming together, the line gelling, Freeman getting more used to the system, all of that. I, I think there's still some upside there. Jason, I might add that I think the heavy packages were really working for us for once. I think the Ricard Tomlinson combination, um, we definitely saw some really productive snaps with that. Whereas I felt like before we were going heavy and it just was like, oh, ho-hum, three yards. Whereas we actually started to get some push and getting some actual running lanes with that package. So that might be something to look out for is how effective are we? You know, Boyle just got activated to the full roster. How effective are we in these heavier packages now? Is it just for show or are we actually dominating like we used to in those packages um, and able to force our will? Because that would be basically all it takes, in my opinion, to really take this running game over the edge is that when you have a package where you're like very much committing to the run and the, its successes that you actually produce there. And like we were saying on third down and short, you get those yards because you're able to bully the team. If we start seeing that out of the run game, the explosiveness that we're missing out of maybe 11 personnel can be missed a little bit more. I think it, what we really want out of this running game long-term given the state of the Ravens is confidence in short yard situations and just, overall net positive gains rather than those really crushing negative or zero yards plays on second and long that do not set you up for success on third down. Yeah. And if we're going to play Tomlinson and Ricard and take Mark Andrews off the field or an extra receiver off the field, we, we better be running the ball because, yeah. you know, especially when Sammy comes back, if you have Bateman, Hollywood, Sammy, 
and Andrews, and there's there's four receivers right there. You put them with your running back, your quarterback. Okay, that should be that's your that's your best lineup. But yeah, if you're gonna take two of those guys off the field and put Boyle and Ricardo on there, you better be able to you better be able to run the ball because uh, getting two three yards even out of that set is not worth it. You might as well just spread them out and throw. But man, what a game for Project Pat Ricard. Mark Schlereth uh, <laughs> on the network sounded like he had a new adopted son. Um, Project <laughs> Pat, this we've seen this before in that Tennessee playoff game last year where Pat just came in and kind of took over a drive with uh, the short passes. Now, I will say, I you know, I don't like having to get to that point, but it's nice to have Project Pat show up and be able to carry an offense for a drive like he did. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, I'll say you have to tune in the Ravens recap to find out if we think Patrick Ricard should be continued to use as a weapon in this offense in the passing game. But I will go out to say uh, one of our other running jokes was about how in the first game of the year, I believe they were like, oh, Owe is uh, a fan favorite. And we were all like, is he? Is he already a fan favorite? Well, I mean, um, he's got I his jersey on, so he, he's he somebody's favorite. One. He certainly became one. But I don't know after that first game, if he was already a fan favorite. It really took until that Chiefs game. But uh I'll, I'll go on to say that they called him uh, Pancake Pat, which I don't. I've never heard any Ravens fan call him that. <laughs> he wants to be called that. He sells the Pancake Pat T-shirts. Oh, is Alec. that right? Yes, oh. he's got. It's a stack of pancakes, Pancake Pat. So I have a feeling that came directly from uh, Mr. Ricard himself. I like oh, okay. Pro Bowl Pat. Excellent. Pro Bowl Pat right. is, is yeah. my own thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I figure that should try to uh, like Pro Bowl should trump a project or a pancake. You know, they, you get you need a lot of uh, projects and pancakes to make the Pro Bowl. <laughs> Pat it, Pat Ricard's well on his way, though. I mean, what a yeah. And I mean, and and aside from that, though, Alec, the way he's being used to chip on these uh, edge rushers and really contribute to the pass protection. I mean, there are times where if we think that there's a weak edge rusher, well, we'll just double team elsewhere and leave Pat on his own out there, man, to, to pass protect. And he's come through on that as well. It's pretty impressive. This all-around game is just off the charts, really, for a fullback. Oh, yeah. I mean, we know he used to go both ways and play defense. But uh, he was joking. But I think he's 100% serious at the same time. In an emergency situation, he's ready to play tackle if he has to. I think to. he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's uh, that kind of enthusiasm and team, and team sport that you kind of want out of a player. And, uh, yeah, he's, like you said, the fact that when he's in the game, he's making an impact and the players are getting, uh, you know, positive, uh, you know, production because of his blocks or whatnot is that's that's really important because you are sacrificing a real playmaker with these wide receivers and, and Mark Andrews taking them off the field is not uh, something to take lightly with the way they're playing. Sure. And there, I mean, there, there'll still be plenty of snaps to go around, but, you know, I was just trying to add to your point where you know, just yeah. put an explanation point on it that if we're going with, with Tomlinson or even Boyle when he comes back now and Ricard on the field, that only leaves you three other guys. And and we have some playmakers, I mean, Duvernay, even Duvernay and Spurts, uh, that we wanted to get some speed on the field. So, yeah, these receivers, though, Hollywood, nine catches for 116, Bateman, five for 52, Mark Andrews, five for 44. And it was funny. I think Hollywood only had uh, – let me see here. Um, thought I had it written down, but it was like he only had three catches through three quarters or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like almost all of his or his major production came in the fourth quarter and overtime, which is it's kind of like uh becoming Hollywood's reputation, big moment here, playoff Hollywood, uh mm -hmm. big moments primetime jet. Prime time jet. Yes, thank you, Alec. That, <laughs> I should have remembered that one. But yeah, big moments when we can we need somebody to count on. And then the yak from Hollywood Brown, like what a what an overall great game for Marquise. Yeah, no touchdowns on that score or that stat sheet, but nine catches for 116 yards is no joke. And I mean, that's number one territory. The way that he was able to come back on those routes, go like a little negative dip around and then get the positive yak. Um, I want to actually take a step back and talk about the maturity of Lamar Jackson. He audibled into that screen pass to him on third and 15, which you may have saw thought as oh i see the defense is going to give us some yards here uh this will allow us to get into better field goal range we were down i believe seven at that point um but maybe it was we were still down i think it was only seven though i don't think it was 14 but um he took that shot 
But then Hollywood goes ahead and gets the 15 yards plus to get the first down. That's a huge play, right? That's a huge difference yeah. making play. Um, really positive, uh, you know, e- uh, you know, return there to be able to get a new set of downs. And um, I think that's something that we talked about. If you're having a hard time pass protecting, and the Ravens did this game, these fast passes really slow down that pass rush and make them second guess about coming at you that way. And um, I think that was one little example of the Ravens kind of adjusting and taking what the defense gave them. And like you said, allowing them to get those yards that uh, they're taking away the deep pass. All right, let's ding and dunk you. Yeah, it was frustrating for me, Alec, because, you know, we've been calling this on, on our preview show for weeks. I've been saying it on Twitter. I've heard other people echo it. And it's like, man, they are playing these deep, you know, four cross shells, these, these just deep, deep stuff. And it's like, get the ball. Lamar's already doing a lot. You know, he's running the ball a lot. He's taking hits in the pocket, trying to deliver downfield. The offensive line's bad. It's like, add it all up. It just makes too much sense to get the ball out of Lamar's hands quickly and get it to his playmakers, take some pressure off of them, get some easy yards that way. That's not mentioning that the running game has trouble getting going. So you add all those things together. I'm I'm sure my viewers are tired of hearing me talk about it. (laughs) But we saw it yesterday. As soon as we started going to the quick passes, it really turned that game around. And then the one note on that uh, that, that Hollywood third and 15 screen, this was a oh no, oh yes emotion for me. I don't know if you felt Uh the same thing. But I'm like, man, we just, man, we, why are we, well, we must be going forward on fourth down because there's no way. Oh, there he goes. So, like, it, it's funny that Lamar has, well, not funny, but it was cool that Lamar had that kind of confidence in Hollywood that he was going to put his head down and do everything he could to get that first down because, uh, I mean, 15 yards is no joke whether they're playing off or not. You're going to get hit. It's going to be a collision. For you to make it, you're going to have to sacrifice. Uh, to make 15 yards off of a off of a bubble screen like that. So, yeah, did you get the uh, the oh no oh no oh yes <laughs> feeling on that play, or or was I alone? Oh, I mean, totally, dude. Like you said, you don't expect bubble screens to go for much more than maybe five seven yards. They need double that, and uh, it was good. It was good blocking, and just that that burst, man. I think he kind of took him for a loop. He he put on those jets, and that's the thing, man. That's the big thing that I think we're seeing out of uh, Hollywood primetime jet in this season is just that he's using his physical gifts to get that extra yak in ways that he before kind of just gave himself up. You see, um, I, I forget which play exactly it was, but you saw him go down the sideline with, with all of his might. And then he slowed down and then went again, it, you know, right, he yeah. like, he gave him that, that little, uh, that stutter hesitation and then just punched again, the accelerator. Um, you know, he's just, he's a quick dude, man. And, and you can do a lot with that. So kudos to him. I think he started being a game wrecker near the end there. Just getting the separation, man. Like he's a total technician. He's a t- he can do anything. Short passes, intermediate, long. He's got it all. He doesn't care that he's 5'10, 5'9, whatever the hell he is, 170 pounds. It doesn't matter. He's gonna get you that yards. He's gonna get the separation. He's gonna get it done. That's all I ever wanted from him, Alec. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think people slept on his route running ability since he got in here. I always told people this guy, I mean, can you imagine trying to cover some of these, these comebacks <laughs> or these, oh, deep, yeah. deep, these deep, they, it's, it's, I mean, no matter how good of an athlete you are, it's not good enough because Hollywood's just as fast, just as quick, probably faster and quicker. And he knows where he's going. So, I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's impossible. Um, and Lamar yeah, knows where he's going and Lamar knows right? where, and they have that connection, which yeah. uh, just shows off. But yeah, if your quarterback says, look, I'm going to throw it to you. We, we need a big 15 yards here. You know, I like seeing Hollywood respond and uh, pick Lamar up for that that choice, that audible choice. Um, how about Bateman, though, man? And his, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's just, what was it? I think his first 10 catches in the NFL all went for, for first downs. They said it on the TV copy yesterday. He yeah. went five for 52, but it's like there's a certain style that I like about Rashad Bateman. And I don't know what it is. It, it's kind of like, He's got the hands. He's got like a little bit of everything to his game. And I think it's just a great mix for a receiver. I think it's the speed through the catch point. That's particularly special. He catches the ball and keeps striding in a way that's a little unique. And um, I also want to say that, you know, not showing up in the stat sheet was that huge, maybe 40 some yard DPI that we got. Gave me major Torrey Smith vibes. Um, You know, I was really excited to see that the Ravens have done horribly this year 
in getting DPI. Uh, not that, you know, uh, I guess you particularly strive for it, but it can be manufactured, right? Like by doing those deep shots, you just give yourself more opportunities to get it called because that's frequently where it happens. If you have the guy beat, it's sometimes a bit decision to, you know, intentionally foul you to make sure you don't get that catch and get those uh, extra yards. So I think that's something that the Ravens can add to their game if they're able to have the privilege to throw it deep, get some time in the pocket. But uh, yeah, man, Bapin's really good. He kind of saved the interception there with some really excellent hands catch where he just dominated at the uh, catch point, got the ball, secured it, first down. I mean, I made this bold prediction on Ravens recap. I'll echo it here. Every year, there's a wide receiver tandem that in fantasy football, which is not real football, but it's wide receiver of anything is a very good correlation, right? Uh, you'll have a wide receiver duo that go both in the top 12. And I'm saying next year, Hollywood and Bateman could easily be that combo. I'm not saying they will be because there's so much variance in fantasy. I'm not trying to, you know, say that they will be. But either way, it, I think that the fact that they even have a shot in hell is great news <laughs> for the Ravens. Never, never have the Ravens had two wide receivers that gave you that kind of scare. And I think the Bateman's just, it just started, dude. He's he's going to be even better as he becomes more pro uh, ready. He gets more recon uh, you know, recognition of what the quarterback's trying to do. Um, more time with that coaching staff. I mean, he's good. He is just, he. the fact that he's producing like this as a rookie is a huge sign of what's to come. Yeah, for me, all his traits just like immediately translate and ooze off the screen and, you know, I think early on we saw with the ability to turn up field in the yak. But yesterday, man, it was that body control. And we saw it on the the crazy catch that he made. He said, yeah, it could have been intercepted. It looked like it looked like it was for a second. But the uh, the, the pass interference that he drew, I, I think I tweeted it out. It was funny, Alec. I don't know if you noticed this, but I switched it up. You know how superstitious I am. Never on, I've never, never been on social media for a Ravens game. Mm -hmm. This right game wasn't going the way I wanted. I was like, I'm getting on Twitter and tweeting some stuff. I need to step up for the team. Y'all <laughs> out there on Twitter to follow me, you know this. TZ, Skeptico, I know you saw me out there. I had to, in fact, I told Skeptic Goat, Skeptic Goat, my fault, that, uh, you know, I needed to do something to help the team. He, he's not as big on superstition. He's tried it all in his sports. But, yeah, I tweeted out. I'm like, how nice is it to have a receiver with body control? who can find the ball, track the ball, turn around and make a play on it. If you don't make a play on that ball, it's not going for DPI. It's an underthrown pass. Heck, it might even get intercepted. But instead, we get a big, big chunk play out of that. Uh, so Bateman has shown me something every game, whether it's getting up field quickly, whether it's fighting for extra yards, whether it's tough catches. This one, it's the body control that came in. I mean, just what a, what a game uh, for him. Um, I wanted to talk about the offensive line, though, for a second, because I'm really ready for Ben Cleveland to come back uh, <laughs> and start practicing. <laughs> um, I thought Tyree Phillips, I mean, I can't wait to watch the game tape on this, but I thought that he held his own and, and did some nice things in the run blocking game. But the left side of our line with Villanueva and Powers, man, they were getting beat and they were getting beat quick and it was causing some negative plays. So I'd really like to see some stability in the left guard. And now, with McCarry out, Phillips is not an option at left guard. Um, he has to play left tackle. So Ben Cleveland, man, I'm looking forward to him to come back, Alec, and hopefully he can be a player for this team. You're 100% right. This is the point, I think, with all of Ravens fans, the Ravens coaching staff can say, you know what, Powers, you've had some you know, okay games. You've had some decent fill-ins. We've seen here and there him getting beat and beat badly, actually – physicality he can't match and it got really nasty against this vikings defensive line he was falling down all like crazy um and just not getting the push that you want and at this point even though i don't think cleveland is going to be perfect he has a lot more upside and i think you got to right. start using him now you're right uh tyree phelps he's stuck dude he is going to be our right tackle solution or a emergency tackle the rest of the year we do not have the privilege to use him as a uh, extra guard, we might have the privilege of using him as a six lineman in some packages um, instead of maybe Cologne. I would maybe suggest that that's an option if we get healthier. But at this point, he is not a guard option, uh, an every down guard option, because 
we are just too thin at tackle, and he has some ability to play it. The other thing that caught my eye from, uh, you know, Ravens reporter from the athletic Jeff Zubek is he was talking about McCary on the sideline without a walking boot and these high ankle sprains. I mean, I didn't expect him back until playoff time or maybe the last few games. But he, he like, and that's, it's kind of like Jeff's a straight up guy. Obviously he's uh, a professional in this business. So I don't take what he says lightly. And, uh, he seemed really optimistic that McCary could come back. I'm wondering, you know, I have to think out loud here, Alec, but I'm wondering if McCary could be at an, an option at left tackle when he comes back. Um, we have Cedric mm. Abwehi, you know, who is a very quick per- person. Like I said, Phillips did pretty well, um, but Villanueva just struggles mightily every game, just getting pushed back into Lamar's lap, sometimes tripping over Lamar's feet. And, uh, you know, with McCary, Again, he's going to be physically overmatched by some, but he's going to give your quarterback time. So, um, man, what a boost would it be to, to have McCarry, especially as we head into these division games? We have the Miami game coming up here Thursday, and we go to Chicago, which isn't going to be an easy game watching their defense, and then the gauntlet hits, Alex. So offensive line, man, is, is a major concern. It's really the only thing holding this offense back from being the best or one of the handful of best offenses in the league. Yeah, that's a great point. And I tell you, if McCarry comes back and does fill in his left tackle and does an admirable job, I mean, that'd be the greatest like heroic story, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, and I don't think you're, you're wrong in thinking about it. I think a lot of Ravens fans are kind of thinking that, you know, if you just think about the way the Villanueva is played and the replacement level of him versus Phillips versus, um, I'm sorry, I, Cedric, uh, I, I, I'm still oh, yeah, way he, yeah, his last name is a little new so to me, but uh, yeah, I think when you look at all of that, uh, that's a very interesting pivot that they can make. Wouldn't wouldn't uh, count it out. Now I'll add that I should have tweeted this out. I I, I made the observation and posted it in our little side chat that we have going uh, in Ravens Recap Discord land. But uh, I was like, guys, isn't it a blessing that McCarry is listed as doubtful for this game? He should be out. Right. He should be heavily out. Not doubtful for this game. He has a high ankle sprain. There is no way that he should be ready, which led me to believe, like you're saying, it might not have been that bad of a high ankle sprain. It might be one of the more milder versions, and he might be back much sooner than we expected, which would be a huge win, right? Huge. I don't want them. To, I don't want him to rush him back, but I kind of do, right? Like, make sure it's healthy. Make sure he's good. But if he can come back sooner rather than later, that is a huge swing of luck for this Ravens team that has had no swings of luck when it comes to injuries. Right, because we're we're getting good play. Out, I mean, I, I think very good play out of Kevin Zeitler, just an awesome player, in shape, prepared, professional. Bozeman stretching is, at dinner. Did you see that? Yeah, video? stretching at dinner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a football. Uh, what was he doing? His pass sets during delivery. Yeah, pass sets. Uh, yeah. This is this is my kind of guy, Alec. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> football's on the brain. It's just what he does. But yeah. uh, I hadn't. So I'm on record. So you're my guy now, and all the viewers that. You know, you haven't heard any, anybody heard it before, but I'm I'm kind of like, hey, can McCarry play left tackle on this on this team? Because Lamar can see the rush coming from you know his from his front side, and he's really good at just ducking somebody and getting out. They don't want him to get to his right anyway. So a lot of times, those left defensive ends, the guys who are on Lamar's right, aren't really coming at him. So that's the that's 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 kind of like a chess piece out there for him, Alec. They just want that piece that the kind of roadblock in Lamar's way, but he's get Lamar's getting steamrolled from the blind side. So why not if McCarry comes back? You heard it here first from your buddy Jason. Put McCarry at left tackle. See how he does, man. Give give AV a week off in the cooker, man. Let him rest his knee and see how let up McCarry audition for that left uh, left tackle spot. So. Uh, yeah, some people call me crazy. Some people won't like it, but I've seen McCarry play left tackle, at least in the preseason, and damn near looked like the best tackle out there at that time, too. So, you know. Bro, shame on Ravens fans for doubting McCarry at this point. He's done everything to prove us wrong time and time again and just prove that his value to the team. For us to say, you can't play left tackle, I would think would be foolish because he's proven everything wrong so far, and I, I give him full confidence. Go out there, man. Go play left tackle. I'm, I'm with you, man. And, and right. you know, you can pull a stunt like they did with Jimmy Smith and, and and McPhee. And I'm sure we'll talk about that when we talk about the defense. You know, they played one in like two or three snaps respectively where 
they weren't playing much. And what it could have been was an intentional like emergency situation. It's a short week coming up against the Dolphins. These are veteran players. Let them basically take a little bit longer by, uh, rest their bodies, and be prepared for the long haul. And you could do that with AV. Have him active. I mean, you have to have a lot of alignment active anyways. He could still play if something goes south. But let McCarry play left tackle. Let Cedric Obwehi play right tackle or Tyree Phillips. See what happens. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, man. Thank you. So when they start coming after me out there and in the comments, I'll, I'll, I'll back sure you up. You I'll be out my there, back. dude. Get my back. Get my back. <laughs> so let's talk about the defense band. Uh, you know, it was uh, – I was very proud of the defense in overtime, Alec. Very proud. They, they've done this too because it's, it's just like – it's a big play defense. You get big plays against the Ravens, but down to down, it's a good defense. Like it's a very, very strange. It's bizarre world for me. Like the whole passing game on the other side. And then we used to have the bend, but don't break defense. Now we kind of have a defense that gives up big plays, but we look, it's just all over the place with this Ravens team. But, you know, I'm looking, uh, we gave up the 50 yard touchdown pass to Justin, Je Justin Jefferson. Kirk Cousins had 187 total pass yards on the game. So we gave up 50 on one play out of 187. Almost a third of their pass, pass yards came on one play. Same thing for Dalvin Cook. Had a 66-yard run. All his other runs, 16 carries, 44 yards. So, uh, And then the big play, uh, the interception from Lamar where Freeman didn't cut the defensive end. Lamar should have saw it. It was kind of like a combination of my bads happening at the worst time and overtime. The defense comes up, shuts him out, puts Lamar back on the field. Justin Tucker field goal game over. So some big performances by this defense, some, some nice individual efforts as well. Is there anybody that you want to talk about in particular on this defense? My defensive MVP was Josh Bynes. That guy has brought such clarity to our linebacking. And I want to point out to Ravens fans, you know, if you're looking at it, Yes, he's now the every down middle linebacker, but he's not because we don't always use a middle linebacker on all our downs. And what you're seeing is we've only taken about a nine snap reduction in this game, at least a nine snap reduction. If you were to flip him and Queen and Queen's playing so much better and that will position, he's able to just attack and just and just play the game and not have to worry about as much. And he is playing so much better for it. I think that's really elevated the play. And then you have Bynes. He was balling out. He was having fun. You know, it, it, it makes you wonder why the Ravens let him walk in 2020. I think that was something I was asking too. You know, the running gag is that I owe him a beer. At this point, I owe him like a six pack, a 12 pack, a, a whole cake. You know, Josh Bynes. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make sure I'll, I'll, I'll drive him home afterwards too, because like, he, you know, I owe him so many beers. He can't drive back, you know, <laughs> we'll make sure we right. do it on the, not on game, you know, the game day or the game before, or you know, I, Maybe the offseason. Wait till the offseason until I pay, repay my debts to uh, Josh Bynes. But I think that guy's been playing out of his mind lately. And um, I, I, that's that's one of the players I would like to recognize. Yeah, 11 total tackles. And the Ravens, after that 2019 season, decided to keep LJ Fort instead of Bynes. You know, a little bit younger player, I believe. Um, maybe a little bit more left in the tank. But Bynes just keeps, uh, keeps going and going. The energizer, linebacker. Like... <laughs> And like you said, he's made two positions better. It's a not only are we getting better play from our middle linebacker, we're getting better play from our weak side linebacker. Patrick Queen was really made for that spot, in my opinion. And just so proud of the Ravens for making that switch to swallow their pride and just say, look, I know we drafted Patrick Queen in the first round. It's a year and a half in. Josh is our best guy. And man, you can just see him coaching on the field. Uh, and just aligning everybody, his discipline on a few of these runs, just sitting there, man, waiting. His vision and anticipation as a linebacker is just awesome. So, yeah, 11 total tackles. We have to talk about Deshaun Elliott, though. Torn bicep, torn tricep. Somebody told me he had something in his leg that was going on. I don't know what's happening, but he was a walking wounded. Uh, by the way, I think he got injured uh, on a sideline tackle by Dalvin Cook and stayed in that game because he clearly wasn't right on the play before he came out. Um, but the talk to me, Alec, about the, the loss of Deshaun Elliott, uh, you know, and what we should be doing moving forward. This isn't necessarily a Vikings game thing, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, on uh, the loss of Deshaun Elliott here. A real heartbreaker. Um, feel for the man, feel for the team. Uh, three out of his four seasons, young man uh, has been out 
for the season due to injury. And every time that he does get healthy and play on the field, he's an impact player who is one of the best players on defense, brings some character, swagger, heavy hitting, and just plays at a high level. Uh, Sixth round pick. You can't ask for much more out of a guy. And unfortunately, it's his contract year. He was playing his butt off. He came back for the Chargers game. He had an excellent game. Best defender on the field that game, some would say. And he, you know, was proving like the, when he came back, the defense looked better. It had some weak games. He come back stability. And then to see this injury, I mean, it's it's devastating because I don't know if he'll play another down in purple and black. I think he will. I think he's a kind of player that hasn't shown enough to other teams to garner a huge contract. And we might be able to compete and give him that scheme fit and the confidence to this, you know, play really well and maybe then get his big contract, maybe one or two year deal. And I think the same applies candidly to Peters. I think Peters is a huge scheme fit here. While I think he would do well in many places, I think he plays exceptionally well here. A one year prove it deal to allow him to get his last contract might be the best thing financially for him. Uh, Instead of trying to get a deal um, immediately after um, off an injury to another team. So maybe both these players will have, uh, you know, a second chance in the 2022 season, but uh, it's a huge loss, man. I mean, Stevens has been playing up and downs. He definitely shows his rookiness and the fact of just matter. He hasn't played much defensive back in his career or converting running back. So he's still raw, but he has a lot of talent. And I think he provides a little bit more free safety ability than Elliot did. So what we were talking about in Ravens recap is this might allow us to really truly use him as the free safety allow Chuck Clark to come into the box a little more often and maybe just change the personnel packages a bit. Cause you're not having two of those kind of tweener guys. Whereas um, Stevens is much more a free safety build. Stevens. Well, I think he can play both actually, but you like, if you have Jimmy out there, you don't want to put Jimmy too much in the box cause you're trying to preserve him. So if Jimmy's out there, he's going to be your free, free safety. He's going to be playing probably the deepest of any safety and then the other guy that I think is going to come into play here, Alec, is Geno Stone. He was actually the the Ravens went, uh, you know, basically had 10 guys at the line on that last defensive stand. And it was Geno Stone playing the deep safety on that last play. Mm. Um, mm. He is the guy that has the deep safety ability as far as the angles that he takes. Uh, the experience you talked about that Stevens doesn't have, Geno Stone believe he played four years at Iowa, uh, whatever it was, he has a ton of experience in that position, um, not being moved around too much. He's used to it. Uh, so I would expect, uh, you know, another dark horse. You heard it here first. Geno Stone, I think is going to get, you know, maybe it's only 10, 15 snaps a game. You know what I mean? It's not going to be full-time role, but to see him try to take some pressure off of Brandon Stevens and Jimmy and that, because I, th- I think Brandon Stevens is actually better in the box I don't know if you were trying to, uh, you know, just talk about his free safety ability, but Brandon's made most of his plays yeah. close to the line of scrimmage. So mm-hmm. it's going to stink to like take that away from him and have him just be on the back end uh, the whole time. But yeah, um, you know, who else stuck out to me in this game was Tyus Bowser. Five tackles. One of them was a tackle for a loss. He actually got his hands on a pass, which was great to see. Uh, didn't catch it, but a nice pass defense, uh, especially down the stretch. You saw him setting that edge. Kind of reminded me of the Tennessee game. We were going five across and, man, just like collapsing. They, they put a – I think it was their backup, backup tight end. I can't remember the, the man's name. He's been in the league for a while. But Bowser just dismissed him and, uh, and made a play. But it was nice to see Tyus get involved in this game, Alec. Yeah, I, I, to, to go off the Stevens point, I completely agree. He has had a lot of um, good plays in, in the box. So I wasn't trying to take that away. I just think he's maybe more natural free safety. Uh, kind of talent than than Elliot, but yeah, you're he's right. Got the, yeah, I mean, he's got the speed for it for free safety. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, I mean, yeah, but he he is good in the box, so that's that's definitely a plus. Good good point about Stone. Uh, but yeah, to go to Bowser, very interesting to me. I think he's had a very um, quiet season so far. Yes, that's not stat sheet shown. And actually, it was a little bit of a, a, a back and forth I had with one of the guys I was watching with. He's like, Bowser needs to live up to his contract. I was like, first of all, we got him for cheap. We got him for a very middle of the pack price for what I think the talent he brings. And uh, second of all, I think he's had some sneaky things that don't show up in stat sheets, aren't like splash plays that, you know, you see him celebrating on the field, but he's changing the way the defense or the offense are playing against our defense. And 
Um, one thing that Peter pointed out that I thought was pretty astute was that um, teams don't run to the side that Bowser's on. They run away from Bowser very frequently. And um, that's not something we usually think about. You usually think of him as a pass defender, but it seems like he's getting respect in the running game as well. So um, I think just an overall good game from Bowser and and kind of quietly having a good season. He is. He's being asked to do a lot too. And it, during the bye week when I was reviewing, I was, you know, just remembering how much we asked him to cover tight ends and, and chip in the middle and all the things that we're asking him to do for it. But, but it was nice to see him, you know, when you get your chances, Alec, to, you know, you look for those splash plays and, and he made him yesterday. Justin Matt BK is another guy I, I had written down that I wanted to mention. Um, he got he got to me early, man. When he got washed away on that j- big, uh, like a twelve yard run play, and I'm like, man, there's Matt Abike. He's got his head down again. And he's getting washed all across the line of scrimmage. But then he came up. I saw him shouting some things at the sideline. Uh, Matt Abike is a, like a nice, you know, polite guy. <laughs> but you saw the monster come out in him and uh, made some splash plays. I had him for three tackles, but some tackle for a uh, tackle for loss. And uh, he really made some noise against that Vikings interior. And we needed to because they had their backup center in. Uh, he uprooted Ezra Cleveland. Uh, man, it was just a nice performance by Justin. Yeah, and, and you know, a big gap with uh, Brandon Williams out this game. So yes. he, he needed to step up. Uh, we freed Washington. The joke was, uh, so Washington, Broderick Washington had 18 snaps. That's 33% of the defensive snaps. Um, gave a nice little rotation there. Uh, maybe maybe our Darius will be uh, unleashed now with uh, the Elliot injury. They'll activate him. <laughs> You're not seeing it. He'll no, I think it's Gen- I think it's Geno Stone. I think. Well, honestly, I mean, he, Gino's already been active, right? So I was just saying they might yeah, have the activation. Yeah, I th- I think it gives us a chance to activate another defensive lineman. But uh, but okay. yeah, I mean, if we want to back up slot corner, um, uh, well, I guess that's Brandon, that's Brandon Stevens and Jimmy too. So. If you want, uh, if you want I, Ardarius, yeah, sure. You can have him in there, but I think well, Ardarius is being saved for next year, uh, really, on this roster. And I think i rather have the defensive line depth, like you just mentioned, over the extra secondary depth from a game-to-game perspective, particularly with Westry uh, coming back into the fold. So, right. uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was more so just going on the, the Washington joke. from The Washington. <laughs> from uh, yeah, week. that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the free Washington week. joke. The, yeah, um, it was uh, yeah, it was Washington for five hundred, Alec. That, yeah, that was <laughs> that was my joke on your show. But yeah, yeah. Uh, you know it. O- overall, though, like with the defense, Alec, uh, you know, you look at the the numbers and they're not good. They're not Raven like, but down to down, it's 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 pretty good defense. It's just these big plays. I really feel like we and we saw it yesterday when we went man up and Cook breaks a tackle, he's gone. Um, and that that play to Jefferson. Clark was all the way stuffed in the box. I don't know if you noticed that, but he lined up. He was like lined up like a linebacker and then tried to drift back at the last minute. And then, you know, what that did is it didn't give him a clear view of what was in front of him. So he bites on the out route and there goes Jefferson right by Marlon didn't have his help. So uh, I think we really still, you know, I'm still kind of pounding the horn to simplify things and play a little more zone defense. Just keep stuff in front of you. Stop giving up these damn big plays Keep stuff in front of you and uh, and and just make the play. I, I would like to see Wink do a little more of that. Yeah, that, that play was super interesting, the Jefferson play, because you had Elliot at the line uh, suggesting it was going to be an out route. He was signaling to them. Then you had Marlin take that advice and use outside leverage. So he was right. completely ready to be on the outside. And then, like you said, I didn't notice the Chuck Clark bit about him being close to the box and kind of back, backpedaling back. But then he started pursuing an out route, which felt like the wrong assignment, given the fact that Humphrey had that leverage. I felt like he should have kept going backwards in case he went long, which is what he did. And the bad play happened. But you're 100 percent right. And this is why I was not too concerned about the Ravens defense is that if you love looking at box scores and not watching games, you think the Ravens defense sucks. But if you actually watch the games, you'll notice it's just big plays. It's miscommunications. It's getting out of position that cause these stats to get so ballooned. But down to down, they're very good. Down to down, they're able to get you those three and outs, and you're not that surprised by it. Yeah, it's, and I, I would yeah, encourage so, people, if the, you want to go back and watch that, watch where Chuck Clark is lined up on that Jefferson touchdown. Yeah. He's in the box. It was like a little trying to do a little too much deception, 
And, uh, you know, I mean, Kirk Cousin laid it up there. It wasn't like a bullet, you know what I mean? It had plenty of time to develop. Chuck just like, yeah, how it is, Alec. I, I don't know if you played or not, but when you see everything in front of you clearly, it's like you don't, you're less likely to make the wrong read. You know what I mean? He, yeah. if, he, if he was backed up 10 yards, I guarantee you he wouldn't have let Jefferson just run by him. He would have picked that up and not bid on that out route. But, uh, but yeah, just some small adjustments, I feel like, Alec. Um, you know, I want to spend the last, the last couple of minutes here talking about the coordinators um, and, and getting your temperature check. Quick passing game on offense, take what they give you. And on defense, prevent the big plays, get into a little more zone, give your corners a little more help. I don't really necessarily care about the blitzing as much. I know Garnett is on here like, don't blitz, don't blitz, don't blitz. Like, you can blitz, but just have some guys back there, you know what I mean? So where if this five, six-man blitz don't come home, you have people who can keep the play in front of them. So anything you want to say on the coordinators uh, on both sides or, or both sides, you can – whatever you got for me, bud. Well, I, I'd like to throw out there, man, I feel for Vikings fans. I feel like they're very mismanaged at this point. Um, just – Looking at the way that they use their weapons, um, it doesn't feel like they're putting it in their playmakers' hands. They're not uh, scheming ways. I mean, Thielen was basically an afterthought. I understand he had seven targets, which is tied for the most against Conklin, but I felt like those targets were not high quality targets. And, um, you know, you got a guy like Jefferson who could be a game breaker, like you saw in that 50 yard. He only got five targets all game. I mean, that can be super frustrating. Yeah. So I can, I can, I feel for that fan base, but. We look at us, you know, I, I take a lot of respect to hear that Roman is no longer uh, scheming the first 15 plays because he's like, we have to adjust on the fly because of we're seeing different things. But I will challenge him to say, are you? Because I think that you see different things than what that team normally does. But when you don't see different things in regards to how people defend Lamar, that's my that's my one takeaway is that if he just assumes they're going to play him like they play Lamar, you might be able to actually scheme a few things. Also, I would suggest planning for both. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, that maybe they do what they normally do. Like, what are the tendencies? What are the people like to do against Lamar and plan for both? I also think, you know, getting to that, finding, finding a way to getting rhythm early is the number one thing the Rams need to be focused on the rest of the year on the offensive right. side. Because, we, like we talked about, when that offense gets going, you don't stop it. It's just a matter of how long does it take to find it to get going and how bad is it at that point? Are you still ahead? Are you winning? Are you behind? Are you even, you know, it's really, that's like the biggest temperature check. Um, if I had to talk about defense, I don't have too much to say right now. I think they're doing the best with what they've got. Um, I'm not like, I, I would give kudos for them making the shift to binds. Um, curious to see. I know that there was a shoulder injury, reported for Brandon uh, Williams, but I was very surprised to see that he was out. I'm wondering if that was like he had other nagging injuries or if that was a wake-up call to him to start playing better. I have no idea, but I respect what they're doing on defense. Um, I think, again, if they just limit the hero ball, they'll be much more effective. Excellent. So these next couple of games coming up, obviously the Dolphins on Thursday, you know, with Brandon Williams, Jimmy Smith, McPhee, you mentioned, I mean, this is basically if if they take off, this is like what three weeks off, you yeah. know, like two bye weeks, three and a half weeks, whatever it is. So maybe it is just a time for the Ravens to to rest their veterans, their older players. Brandon Williams, give him you know three weeks, you know, to to really buckle down for this uh, this tough stretch we have coming up. I mean, hey, hopefully we're playing into February. You know what I mean? It's still November, yeah, so I hope so, so too. a long way to go. But uh, but yeah, Alex, I, I wanted to thank you for joining me. A uh, lot of fun. Always good talking to you. Check out uh, Huddle It Up Films and Alex uh, NFL Pick Shows, by the way. Alec uh, was, was doing really well until this week. Yeah, I know. It was a bad week, dude. Although this game might be all right, so we'll see. Do not, I told you not to ruin it for me, bro. I'm not saying not it's ruin. all right or not. I'm just saying it might be all right. All right. Well, with that, <laughs> I'd like to thank my football family. <laughs> well, punch this man down to, you know. He's lucky. He's, he's lucky. He's more than. I'm not saying who's away. winning. All I'm right. not saying who's winning. All I'm right. just yeah, saying we're, that we're, it might be covered. I don't know. All right. All right. And he might have jinxed he's, it. You know, we, I can't. I can't even with this guy. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, man. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I really appreciate everything you do and for the channel. Check out Ravens Recap. Uh, follow Alec on Twitter. 
uh ravens recap you can find that on all your streams go ahead and uh, tell people about this yeah yeah you know I'm you old man. On, on the any podcast player spotify we added ourselves there recently and uh yeah follow us on twitter ravens underscore recap if you want those uh quips sometimes i i tweet more in the game than others sometimes i just watch the game uh you know retweeting cool things that i see uh, or that other people see peter puts a weekly poll up that's always a lot of fun so uh, the peter poll yeah the peter poll it's usually on friday nice nice but i imagine it'll come a little sooner this week because the thursday night game yeah nothing nothing wrong with the peter poll i mean to each their own you know what i mean (laughs) but uh with that we will sign off thank you very much for watching my football family alex say goodbye to people now you know what to do (laughs) good night guys